What's up everyone? Today we're going to be talking about group theory and how it relates to cryptography. Now group theory in a college or graduate school course can be a semester or more, but today we're just going to be scratching the surface of this. So I'm going to be teaching you exactly what you need to know in group theory to be able to build a strong foundation to then have further study in things such as ECDSA, BLS signatures, zero knowledge proofs, ZK snarks, ZK EVMs, and all that other good stuff. But we need to start from the fundamentals. So the goals of this video are for you to understand the definition of a group, understand the definition of a field, and more specifically a finite field. And like I mentioned, it'll be a primer for all these other advanced cryptography topics that we'll get into in later videos. And lastly, to just reduce the fear of mathematics and really uncover what's inside the black box. I feel that just a small understanding can really ease the transition into understanding some of these more complex topics and being able to read papers and do more research on your own. Now the prerequisites. I'm going to assume that everyone watching this video is familiar with modular arithmetic, like modular addition, modular multiplication, and that's about it. So if you have that, then let's get started. Today we're going to be talking about group theory. Group theory is the mathematical study of groups. So the logical place to start is the definition of what a group is. I'm going to go through the definition of a group. If this seems too abstract, don't worry and just hang on, as we'll go through some examples shortly afterwards, and it will all make sense. So a group consists of two items, a set of elements and an operation. OK, so what's a set of elements? For example, the numbers 0, 1, 2. Also, another example, negative 1, 5. And what's an example of an operation? Well, the most common ones are addition and multiplication. Generically, we can denote an operation with a dot. And in our definition of a group, we'll be using the dot notation. Later on, we'll be using addition and multiplication when I give you examples of groups. Now a group needs to fulfill four different properties, closure, associativity, identity, and invertibility. So let's talk about each one. Again, if this still seems abstract, I'll quickly go over the definition, and then we'll go over an example, and then everything will be clear. The first property is closure. What closure means is that for every two elements in a group, call them A and B, the operation of A and B is also in the group. Okay. The second definition we need to go over is associativity. What this means is that for any three elements in the group, A, B, and C, we can take the operation of A and B, take that result, and then do the operation with that result with C. And that's equivalent to first taking the operation of B and C, and then taking the operation of A with that result. I'll write this out. So essentially what we're saying is that if we first do the operation on A and B and then do it on C, or if we first do the operation on B and C and then do it on A, we get the same result. So the order in which we perform the operation doesn't matter. The third property is identity. This property states that there is one special element in this group called the identity element. We'll call that I. And for every single element in this group, call it A. If we take the operation of A with this identity element, we get back A. Let me write that down. The fourth property that we're going to go over is called the invertibility property. This property states that every element A in this group has an element B that's also in this group such that the operation of A and B is the identity element I that we defined in the third property. So just to recap, a group is a set of elements and an operation that fulfill the four properties of closure, associativity, identity, and invertibility. This is the definition of a group. Now some groups have a fifth property, an additional property called commutativity. Commutativity states that for every two elements A and B, the operation of A and B 
is the same as the operation of B and A. So what we're saying here is that the order of A and B does not matter. Again, to repeat, this is an optional property that only some groups have. If a group has this property, we call it an abelian group or a commutative group. Either of these terms mean the same thing. Now that we've finished the definition of a group, as promised, let's go through an example and this abstract definition will become very clear once we see the concrete example. So the example I'm going to choose is the additive group of integers mod 6. So for this group, what is the set of elements and what is the operation? Well, the set of elements are the integers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to, but not including, 6. And what is the operation? Well, as the name suggests, in the additive group, the operation is addition. Now note that we are working in the group of integers mod 6. So this addition is actually a modular addition. Now I have assumed that everyone watching this video is familiar with modular arithmetic. So if I say 3 plus 5 mod 6, then you can do 3 plus 5 equals 8 mod 6 equals 2. That should be familiar to you. If not, then please review modular arithmetic before continuing on. Okay, now we have our set of elements and the operation. Now let's go ahead and check if it fulfills the four required properties for it to be a group, and maybe even the fifth property, and see if it's an abelian group. The first property we're going to check is closure. If I take any two elements in this set and add them together, is the resulting element also in this set? If I take 1 plus 3, I get 4. Mod 6 is still 4. Is 4 also in this set? Yes, it is. Let's try another two elements. What about 4 plus 5? Well, 4 plus 5 equals 9. Mod 6 equals 3. 3 is also in this set. You'll notice here that I'm conveniently using the equal sign instead of the congruent sign, which actually has three lines just for the ease of notation. In any case, you can check for yourself that if I take any two elements in this set and add them together, I will get another element that's in this set. Awesome. So what about associativity? If I add A and B and then add C, is that equal to if I first add B and C and then add A? You can go ahead and check for yourself that this is true for any three elements that are in this set. All right, now how about the identity property? First of all, which element should we choose to be the identity element? Let's go ahead and choose zero to be the identity element i. Then for any element in this set, if I add that element with zero, do I get the element back? As you can see, based on the rules of modular addition, if I take any element and add it with the zero, I do get the element back. And therefore, the identity property holds as well. Now the last property, invertibility. This requires that every element A has an inverse B that's also in the set, such that A plus B equals zero, since we had chosen zero to be the identity element I in the third property. So let's give it a try with some values. If we pick A to be one, what does B need to be so that A plus B equals zero? Well, if we choose B to be five, then 1 plus 5 equals 6, mod 6, which is 0. Now how about if a equals 3? What is the inverse then? Well, the inverse then would be 3, because 3 plus 3 is 6, mod 6, which is 0. I chose this example to illustrate that an element's inverse can be itself. Now we have just shown that the additive group of integers mod 6 is actually a group. Let's see if it's an abelian group. In other words, does the property of commutativity also hold? Well, for any two elements A and B, does A plus B equal B plus A? As you can check for yourself, it does. So the additive group of integers mod 6 is not just a group, but it's actually an abelian group. Simple enough, right? Great. 
Now we've seen our first example of a group. Now what happens if I change our operation from addition to multiplication? Is it still a group? Let's find out. Remember, this operation is not just regular multiplication, but it is modular multiplication. Let's go ahead and check our four properties beginning with closure. If we take any two elements in this set and multiply them together, is the resulting element still in the set? You can go ahead and check for yourself that if we take any two elements in the set and multiply them together using modular multiplication, we always end up with another element that is in the set. So closure holds. What about associativity? Does a times b then times c equal a times parentheses b times c? Again, you can go ahead and check for yourself that this also holds. Now let's check the identity and invertibility properties. Which element here should we choose as our identity element i? Well, as you can probably guess, in multiplication, we would choose the element 1 to be our identity element. Now if we choose 1 to be the identity element, does every element times 1 equal itself? It does. Therefore, the identity property holds as well. So let's go ahead and check invertibility. Let's go ahead and start with the element 5. Does 5 have an inverse? Well, 5 times 5 is 25. 25 mod 6 is 1, which is the identity element that we picked in the third property. Therefore, 5's inverse is 5. Okay, so far so good. Let's go ahead and pick 4. Is there an element in this set such that 4 times that element equals 1? Go ahead and pause the video and try this out. So what did you find? Turns out that there isn't an element for 4. 4 times 0 is not 1. 4 times 1 is not 1. 4 times 2 is not 1. 4 times 3 is not 1. 4 times 4 is not 1. And 4 times 5 is not 1. Therefore, 4 has no inverse. So our invertibility property does not hold. Not every element in the set has an inverse. Therefore, this set is not a group. As a small caveat, we generally don't require that 0 has an inverse. It's a special case, but to reiterate, we do require all other elements have an inverse. In this case, we chose the integers mod 6 and showed that it is not a group under multiplication. It turns out that if we choose a number that's a prime number, so instead of 6, we chose 5 or 7 or 11, we actually do get a group. So like the integers mod 5 under multiplication is a group. I wanted to highlight this because oftentimes in cryptography, you'll see the use of prime numbers. And this is one of the reasons why. So now I feel that you probably have a good understanding of what a group is. So let's go ahead and move on to our next topic, fields. All right, we're almost there. So one more definition that we need to know is what a field is. A field will be really simple to understand now that we know what groups are. So a field is just a set of elements that are an abelian group under both the addition operation and the multiplication operation. They also have the distributive property, which is the same distributive property that you've learned in elementary school. And that's it. Now you know what a field is. Now looking back at what we've just done, the integers mod 6 is not a field. Why? Because even though it's an abelian group under addition, we had just shown that it is not an abelian group or even a group at all under multiplication. However, the integers mod 5 is a field because it's an abelian group under both addition and multiplication. What are some other fields that we're familiar with? For example, the real numbers are a field. They are an abelian group under both addition and multiplication. You've been using this field without even knowing it was a field. However, the real numbers are an infinite field. There are an infinite number of elements in the group. Some elements in the group, for example, are negative 3, negative 2.999 repeating, pi, 15, and so on. There are an infinite number of elements. Typically in cryptography, we are more interested in what we call finite fields, fields that have a finite number of elements. So for example, the integers mod 5 is a finite field. 
it contains the elements 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So five elements total. So it's a finite field. The reason why groups and finite fields are so important in cryptography is because there are certain problems that are hard to solve if we limit the inputs and outputs to finite fields and groups. But these problems would be easy to solve if we were using an infinite field like the real numbers. For example, the log problem. Now I'm sure that all of us have learned about log in high school. If I asked you to solve log base 2 of 32, what I'm asking you is how many times 2 is multiplied by itself to get 32. And the answer, as we all know, is 5. And if we use the real numbers as our field, we can even get decimals. So if I asked you to find the log base 2 of 33, you could punch that into your calculator and give me a response in milliseconds. But it's not so easy if we're using a finite field. If I gave you the integers mod some super large prime number, and I asked you to find the logarithm, it would be an extremely difficult problem. In fact, it's an NP problem. We still don't know a fast algorithm to solve this problem, and that's exactly what cryptographers love. A way to move forward very easily, but very hard to invert. And this is what is called the discrete logarithm problem. Awesome, so we've covered a lot of ground today. Hopefully now you feel more confident about groups and finite fields. So just a quick recap. A group is a set of elements and an operation that fulfills certain properties. A field is a set of elements that is an abelian group for both the addition and multiplication operations and has the distributive property. And lastly, both groups and finite fields are super important to cryptography because of the discrete logarithm problem. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Thank you.